Now, we might come up with a theoretical model for how things respond dielectrophoretically, but it turns out in any real experimental case, you go in the lab and you measure this. And so I want to talk a little bit about how one might go about measuring some sort of dielectrophoretic response. And in fact, the geometry that, that Ben used was very typical, very prototypical. And in this case, this is called an interdigitated electrode. And the idea here is that you have two different electrodes, one that's connected to one voltage, one that's connected to a negative voltage. And you have a whole bunch of little fingers in between here. And these two fingers basically induce an electric field in between them. And this is consistent throughout this whole system. If you then encapsulate this into a uh, microfluidic device, you can have a flow of a suspension of particles that's moving from left to right. And at the floor of this microfluidic device, you can have a non-uniform electric field. Because of the existence of these electrodes, and because these electrodes are really a Dirichlet condition on the Laplace equation, basically that this is establishing that there's a specific voltage, you know, 5 volts here, negative 5 volts there. If we look locally, we'll find that the regions of high electric field are always the ones near the electrodes. And therefore, if our object is positive dielectrophoretic, we expect it to be attracted to the electrodes. If it's negative dielectrophoretic, we expect it to be repelled. And this allows us to then characterize particles in a couple of different ways. So if you look at this particle, it's moving along. It might have some net force if its if velocity is different from the, for, or the velocity of the fluid. If it's experiencing a positive dielectrophoretic response, it'll be attracted to these electrodes. If it's negative dielectrophoretic, it'll be repelled. And again, there are a couple different ways we can characterize this. If the particle is just sitting there and it's experiencing negative DEP, when I energize these electrodes, I expect this particle to float up. But it's not going to keep going up uh, forever. It's going to go up a little bit of the way until it gets far enough away that the, from the electrodes that the gradient of the electric field squared becomes small. And in fact, it'll go to some equilibrium where the dielectrophoretic force is equal to the net gravitational force. I then can measure how high that particle is. And by measuring how high it is, I am effectively measuring the magnitude of the negative dielectrophoretic response. If it goes higher, the negative DEP force is stronger. If it's lower, the negative DEP force is smaller in magnitude. A second way I can characterize this is I can have a suspension of particles, and I can flow them all through. And then I can use positive DEP to try to capture these cells. And when I do that, now the argument is that the positive dielectrophoresis will grab onto these cells and hold them close to the electrode. Meanwhile, the fluid is streaming by, and this is causing a net viscous force on this particle. If the particle is being held in place, then this, we know that that dielectrophoretic force is larger than the fluid force on the particle. And again, now the question is, given that I want to trap it, how much voltage do I have to apply? So experimentally, you might get something that looks like this. You can see this is a big interdigitated electrode. This is one electrode and another. They're connected to these interdigitated fingers. And there's a small microchannel that goes through it. Now's probably a good time to, to stop. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I actually can't see anything, as you might expect. So I, don't, I can't tell if I'm pointing at the presentation or, or not. Um, yes, yes. Oh, uh, I would love to elaborate on that. So let's suppose I have a micro device and I have some electrodes that look like this. And let's say this is connected to an AC voltage. And then this is connected to ground, right? So I, I basically have uh, a Dirichlet condition on the Laplace equation. So this is basically ground. This is this AC voltage, which is changing in time. So I'm going to have a bunch of field lines, field lines denoted in blue. Oh, color chalk. So my field lines are going to look a little bit like this. Right? These field lines are definitely going to be concentrating at these corners, for example. And so if you look at this, the very high regions of electric field are going to be right here, right here, right here, and right there. Right? Once I get farther away, right, I mean, you know, I, I have these field lines. They're going to start getting farther apart from each other. Up here, the field line is really quite weak. Once I get up here, you're correct. The field will become uniform, and the DEP force will go to zero. So for a levitation experiment, what this means is that a particle that starts out here, 
if it's experiencing negative DEP, will have a net force up, and it'll keep going up until it gets to some point, say here, where there's a tiny gradient of the squared electric field, but not enough to overcome gravity anymore. <clears throat> if I want to trap the cells that are coming by, and I have a uniform concentration of particles, you might ask, well, wait a second, if there's a particle up here, and a particle here, and a particle here, and a particle here, and a particle there, you might say, well, wait a second, this one is never going to get trapped because the magnitude of the squared electric field gradient there is low. And that's right. And so, in fact, I think on the next slide, uh, I'll describe or I'll show a movie of how we go about quantifying this. And basically what you find is that when the clausius mazzotti factor is high, you can capture a larger fraction of the space. When the clausius uh, mazzotti factor has a small magnitude, then you can't capture the whole space, and so you get less signal. Does this address your question at all? Other questions? Radio. Ah. Okay. The, the Sesame Street alien episode that involves the radio is my favorite. Because uh, how many people remember the radio one? Okay, so in the radio one, the most famous one is the phone. So they go to this house and they find a phone and they... First, they think it's a book, and they, they actually they, ca they carry around a book. So the whole joke with the Sesame Street Yip Yip Aliens is that they carry around this book that's supposed to explain to them what things are on Earth. And so anytime they become cues by, confused by something, they look to each other and they go, book, 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 And then they look in their book, and they come up with a guess on what things are. So they come down, and they find a phone, and then they say to each other, book, 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 and they look in the book, and then they guess that it's like a dog, and they bark at it, and they guess that it's a cat. And then finally it rings, which terrifies them. And of course, when yip-yip aliens are, are frightened, they move their jaw above their head. <laughs> the interesting thing is the only actuator on the yip-yip alien is the location of the lower jaw. So all speech has to be communicated with the lower jaw. A ring sound involves it going back and forth, and then fear means that the lower jaw goes over the head. So... Yeah, so the, so the phone rings, they get scared, they finally figure out that it's a phone, and then they do a little yip-yip alien dance. <clears throat> My favorite one is the radio one, where they find this radio, and they basically just keep changing the stations to see if they like anything. So first they find some classical music, and they decide that they don't like that. And then they find some like late 70s pop, like some, some, sort of, some sort of proggy band, like Yes, or something like that. And they decide that they don't like that either. And then they finally they find Disco Inferno by the Tramps, and then they hate this the most. <laughs> and, and they just, like, they go crazy and they're mad. And then finally they, like, dial the, of course, this is, you know, the late 70s or early 80s, so there's a radio knob. So then they finally dial it in and they get static. And then they get really excited and then they do a little dance to the static. Okay. Huzzah. All righty. Okay, so here's experimentally how we do things. And then this is an example of what things might look like. You have a stream of particles that are moving in. You can see here that are moving too fast for you to see the individual particles. They're now being trapped in, in these regions. And then the way that we quantify this <coughs> is by quantifying the magnitude of the intensity of, of particles that have been labeled fluorescently. And so presuming this still works after dropping my computer, this may or may not be a video that shows how this happens. Right, so you see some stuff streaming in. Voltages get turned on and off. When the voltage gets turned on, you'll see these particles start to be trapped. When you turn it off, they're they released. During this process of trapping and releasing, you can see some signal here that starts at zero and then goes up and then comes down, and then it goes up again and comes down. And this corresponds to our turning the voltage on either to a different level or for a different length of time. And so basically what you're doing is you're integrating what is the effect of applying a field to this system, and you're integrating, you're basically adding up how many particles that you've trapped. <clears throat> then you can take this data and you can analyze this in some detail to come up with an estimation of what this clausius mazzotti factor is. And I'm pretty sure Ben has lots of detailed slides talking about how he does that, but that detail is not important. Okay. So when you do stuff like that, you can plot these things in a couple of different ways. If you plot the trapping potential itself, you get data that looks like this. Which what's more interesting to me is this graph. And this graph is basically plotting the clausius mazzotti factor with a fudge factor as a function of frequency. And so in this case, you can see, you may recall that in class I drew these sigmoids that started out high and then went down and then went negative and went like that. <clears throat> 
And you can see it, of course, it's not as clean in the experimental data as it is when we draw it on a chalkboard, but you can see this same trend. And you can see in this case, this is data that's now being plotted out. It's really good if I can get the, yes, if you can get the, uh, <clears throat> if you look at this data as a function of different conductivity of the medium. So I don't know if you can read this, but this is conductivity of the medium. This is uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 4th Siemens per meter, 24 times 10 to the 4th Siemens per meter, 44 times 10 to the minus 4th Siemens per meter. So this is an example of how the same particle, if you change the conductivity of the medium, you change the relative component of the polarizability that's a function of that ohmic current. And then that, that then changes the frequency at which you see these responses change.